we are tweaking again our worship service, and so the order of service at the beginning is a little bit different. Uh, we're going to start with the announcements because announcements are really not a part of the worship. And um, I appreciate the bell being rung, but they did not look at the bulletin. Then the bell gets rung. It's okay, it's okay, because the bell, the purpose of ringing the bell is to call us to worship. So from now on, we'll be doing our welcome announcements and our uh, passing of the peace, and then you'll hear the bell, and then Deetta will take off on the prelude. And if we mess up, that's fine, because I'll be the first one that does it. Welcome, welcome, welcome on this holiday weekend. Uh, it's so good to see so many of you dressed in your occupation. If you are dressed for your occupation, would you just stand for a moment? Because I am learning things about a number of you that I did not know. Marv, I have no idea you are an anesthesiologist. Never knew. So thank you, and, and our resident chef here has goodies for you in the back. She said she couldn't be a chef without bringing something for you to taste. So she's got a big basket back there. Make sure that you stop by and get yourself a treat. Um, several announcements. Uh, the Messy Church team is going to meet at the Parsonage at 5.30 on Wednesday. And then dinner and conversation this week is at Dogwood. Please draw your attention to the bus trip to the Fox Theater in St. Louis. And also, uh, we want to remind you that next Sunday is Rally Day and we kick off our fall schedule. Lots and lots of things going on. The cereal drop will take place. And I know that they would like for you to come on Saturday, if you want to help set up, come on Saturday at 3, at 1. Okay, if that's a one, I don't have my glasses on and that's regular print, sorry. At one, uh, to help set up the cereal boxes. And uh, then two weeks, oh, well also next week, we're going to present Bibles to the fourth graders. Uh, we will be opening the 150th anniversary time capsule. And I'm trying to think. Hang on. I'm going to have to cheat here. Cereal dropped. Oh, and the new playground will be unveiled next week. So make sure you're here. And then on two weeks from today is finally our 175th anniversary. We have been celebrating all year. And it's going to culminate in two weeks when we will welcome the Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia Thompson who is the President and uh, General Minister of the United Church of Christ into our pulpit. There will be a catered meal following with a number of letters uh, from previous pastors and people connected with the church and just some fun things to do. So make sure that you plan to be with us. And we do want to congratulate Reverend Karen uh, Petmeyer, who received the Lou and Mary Anna Speller Humanitarian Service Award at the conference meeting uh, a week ago. She received this award because of her work for um, at, with the Eden Seminary Garden and the Gleaning Project. And the Gleaning Project is something that we are very familiar with and associated with. And when she received her award, uh, she called up Lonnie and Jana to be with her since they are such an integral part of it. But we're very proud to have, to share in her recognition. And um, it's just another exciting mission that we have here. Are there any announcements that I am forgetting? Okay, then let's take a moment and greet one another in the name of Christ. See God's grace in your neighbor's face.
God calls us to worship. <clears throat> Join me in this. A gift of a new day. A new day with surprising miracles. A gift of a new day, God's gift to us. God to worship, please join me. You, gracious God, are love itself, and perfect love casts out fear. Come to us in merciful patience, we pray, to love us from fear to trust, from anger to grace, from doubt to faith. Love us from our self-centeredness to hearts that willingly give themselves in general. Christ in service. Love us out of our scarcity to hearts overwhelming. Love us from brokenness to wholesome, from resentments to forgiveness withheld, to forgiveness freely offered, just as it has been freely offered to us. Come to us, Lord, overwhelming us with your love that we might love as you first loved us. Amen. Are you still asleep? No one's talking to me. Okay. Still asleep. Okay. Well, I see that some of you did dress up. And uh, are you wanting to be a chef when you grow up? Yes. Do you see our chef out here? Can you give her a little wave? You guys might want to take a picture later. 
Yeah, did you? Okay, excellent. Do you want to be a certain kind of a chef, or do you just want to do you want to do pastry or or sweets, desserts, kind of thing, or do you want to do everything? I just want to do everything. Everything. Maybe we'll see you, you know, 20 years from now on Top Chef on TV. That would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Yeah. And uh, Moana, right? Are you wanting to be Moana when you grow up, or do you want to be an actress, or? I want to be a princess. A princess, excellent goal choice. Excellent goal choice. So is Moana your favorite princess? Mine is Aurora. Uh, what about the other, two? the other two? What do you want, do you know what you want to be when you grow up? An artist, oh, you've got paintbrushes and everything, excellent. That is something I cannot do, and I admire people who can. You want to teach art? Very good. A physical therapist? Excellent. That's, those are wonderful things that you want to be. And I hope that you get to be them when you grow up, because I think that's wonderful. I'm wearing the, the tools of my trade, so to speak. Um, in our tradition, ministers generally wear a robe, although I buck against tradition, mine's navy blue instead of black. And then the stole represents two things. The stoles that I wear, and I wear all kinds of different stoles, but the stole is a symbol of taking on the yoke of Christ to serve. A yoke is something that, that with oxen, uh, they, they put a yoke on them to make so they work together. And so this is the yoke of faith, but it's also a towel. It's meant to be symbolize a towel because on Monday Thursday, when Jesus had his last meal with his disciples before his crucifixion, he wiped, he cleaned their feet, he washed their feet, and he dried them. And so this is also a towel of service too. That's the symbolism of it. Well, I think it's important that we, when we, fig when we figure out what to do, because sometimes you can get all the way through school and realize it's not what you want to do. And that happened to me. All my life, I wanted to be a teacher. And that's what I went to, that's what my undergrad work is in. I became a teacher, high school teacher, humanities, literature, and music history. And long about my last semester of school, as I was getting ready to graduate, I started feeling that this was not going to be what was going to fulfill my life. And I felt God calling to me to go into ministry, which was the last thing in the world I wanted to do. And I ran from it. I mean, it was like the story of Jonah who didn't want to be God's prophet, and so he ran away. I tried to ignore it. I tried and tried and tried to ignore it. But the more I tried to ignore it, the more I felt God saying, um, no, I have other plans for you. And so I felt God call me. And so I graduated from college and entered immediately into seminary and spent three more years at school. So I hope that you get to be what you want to be. And I hope that you have a wonderful life doing it. Because I think God wants only the best for you. And so even if you don't go into the ministry, I hope you will hear God's voice somewhere at some point saying, you are an artist. You're meant to teach art. You are a chef. And you are meant to create wonderful things for people. And you are a princess and you need to use that princess power wisely and for the good of everyone. And that you are a rockin' physical therapist, because goodness knows I've had my, I don't my have physical power yet. Well, as uh, power when you rule, because a princess needs a kingdom or a queendom. So, yeah, but that's a good point. Well, let's have a prayer. I have Oreos for you today. I think there's one Teddy Grahams deep down in the bottom, but that's it. All right, let's have our prayer. Dear God, bless the labor of our hands and help us to find the purpose you have for each of us. Amen. Thank you.
let us give back to God with gratitude for all the blessings received. join me in the prayer of dedication. Lord of all life, you have brought your word to us today, and you have called us to the ministry and service. We ask that you would dedicate our gifts and our lives to faithful actions through the Church of Jesus Christ. Amen. As we gather together in prayer, I would ask if there are any prayer requests to add. Yes. I. Excellent. Thank you. Kennedy is having some more surgery on her vocal cords. Any other prayer requests? Oh, yes. Huh? His son's ship has been moved where the bombings are taking place uh, in Israel. Okay, and his, he was due to be out, but they've extended his um, deferment until through, uh, through November, and he has a child due September 11th. We will certainly keep all of them in our prayers. Any other prayer requests? then let us turn our hearts and our minds to God in prayer. God, you are the gardener, gently cultivating the soil and seeds of our lives. You give us water and sun and wind and nutrients and life. Thank you for all you give us, for your spirit that nurtures and sustains us, for growing seasons and especially for the warmth of the sun. May we be nourished into new blossoms of abundant life. May we learn the gifts of gentleness, kindness, compassion, and peace. Help us now to always be forgiving and loving. Show us how to turn away from anger and hate. Help us, Lord, to appreciate all that we are, our lives and spirits, our bodies and our thoughts. And always, Lord, grow within us the desire to live and work for peace in our church, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our nation, and most especially in our world. 
Hear us as we pray together the prayer taught to us by our Lord and Savior. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Testament scripture selection is from Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. <clears throat> the voice of my beloved, look, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom, and they give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. The New Testament scripture selection is from Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes had come from Jerusalem, who had, I'm sorry, who had come from Jerusalem, gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders and they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups and pots and bronze kettles and beds. So the Pharisees and the scribes ask him, why do, you, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites as it is written. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
I'm okay, just got a little overheated. So I thought I'd take off the robe and show you what ministers wear the rest of the week because we know they only work one day a week. Whew. Maybe it's the subject matter, I don't know, but I'm just... Whew. Let us pray. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be truly acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and Redeemer. Amen. A story is told of a little girl who 
was asked to write an essay on birth. She went home and asked her mother how she had been born. And her mother, who was busy at the time, said, the stork brought you, darling, and left you on the doorstep. Continuing her research, she asked her dad how he had been born. Being in the middle of something, her father similar, similarly deflected the question by saying, I was found at the bottom of the garden. The fairies brought me. So then the girl went and asked her grandmother how she had arrived. Oh, I was picked from a gooseberry bush, said the grandma. Well, armed with this information, the girl wrote her essay. And when the teacher asked her later to read it aloud in front of the class, she stood up and began. There has not been a natural birth in our family for three generations. <laughs> now what I'm going to tell you next is a true story. It happened in the early 1960s in a local high school in Toms River, New Jersey, before the Supreme Court ruling that banned Bible reading in public schools. Back in those days, I know a number of you will remember this, you know, the school's opening exercises included a prayer, the Pledge of Allegiance, daily announcements, and a selection from the Bible. And in this case, it was read by a student over the PA system. And according to school tradition, it was up to the student to choose the Bible reading. You know, and students sat there sleepily in their homeroom classes, at their desks, only half listening to the opening exercises drone on and on and on, until one particular morning. On that morning, one by one, the students in homeroom sat up and began play, paying very close attention to the words of the Bible reading from the venerable King James Version. How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince's daughter! The joints of thy thighs are like jewels. They move, th thy navel is like a round goblet which wanteth not liquor. Thy belly is like a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins. Thy neck is like a tower of ivory. Well, you can imagine the impact of those words on a school full of adolescents first thing in the morning. It was, to say the least, memorable. So memorable that the teachers were still telling the story decades later. But there's an epilogue. By order of the principal himself, the student reader was instantly sacked despite his fervent protests that all he was doing was reading from the Bible. And from that day forward, until the Supreme Court ruling, the principal chose the Bible passages for the opening exercises. Dangerous stuff, those Bible verses. The Song of Songs might be the raciest book in the Bible. And for whatever reason, it only appears in the lectionary on rare occasions. So when it does appear, I like to preach from it. To generations of Christians, the Song of Solomon, or the Song of Songs, as it's sometimes called, has been a bit of an embarrassment. It's one of only two books in the Bible, the other one is Esther, that doesn't once directly mention God. And during the Middle Ages, Bible scholars went to elaborate lengths to interpret this book as highly symbolic. Some taught that this florid love poetry was really about the soul's relationship to God. Others, somewhat strangely, claimed it was about God's love for the Virgin Mary and she for God. If you think you're hearing lovers sighing to each other in a moonlight glade, then think again, say these Middle Ages scholars. When you hear the woman's voice crooning, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. All of this is supposed to be secret code 
for an earnest and devout and thoroughly chaste piety. I think that sounds pretty far-fetched myself. What possible reason could the author have for hiding religious sentiment behind steamy love poetry? It's more faithful to take the Song of Solomon at face value. It is a joyous celebration of committed love in every aspect, including the physical, as a wonderful and perfect gift from God. Now, given the puritanical history and nature of our nation, especially the founding fathers and mothers, the Song of Solomon causes a lot of uneasy embarrassment among those of the Christian faith. And this has as much to do with the hang-ups of our society as with the book itself. Our society tends to understand human love in a binary way. Love is either idealized and spiritual, or it is sensual and physical and never the twain shall meet. On the one hand, you have the lacy Valentine's hearts and bouquets of roses. And on the other is graphic extreme, or a graphic content from the deepest, darkest corners of the inter internet. One extreme, according to our culture, is good. But the other is bad. And it seems there's no middle ground. And St. Paul had to struggle with that too, separating the flesh from the spirit. The Song of Solomon knows no separation between the physical and the spiritual. Love is strong as death, passion fierce as the grave, the poet writes. Its flashes are flashes of fire, a raging flame. The author sees no need to construct a wall between the spiritual and the physical. And to this divinely inspired poet, they are two sides of the same coin. There are three primary ways to interpret the Song of Solomon, and none of them are fully literal. The first says that the song gives expression to human love. Most American readers would not find the poetry to be explicitly sexual, though it has been interpreted that way. Look at this good angel coming up to me. She just brought me something. Thank you. OK. Oh, thank you. I have one of those little things. I, I wore it at one point, but now I'm going to have to find them and put them up. So sorry about this. Whew. I've been doing too much PT this week. Whew. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Whew. Okay. Most American readers would not find the poetry to be explicitly sexual, though it has been interpreted that way. It is certainly erotic in one sense or another, and this is likely the original meaning of these songs when written. It is also the understanding of most modern interpreters. Secondly, a large number of Jewish and Christian com commentators follow a semi-allegorical interpretation in which the detailed metaphysical love language conveys God's love for Israel or Christ's love for the church or for the individual, and vice versa. This, however, overlooks the greater likelihood that the song initially was intended to be a compilation of human love poetry. A third, a third interpretation combines the best of both human love and divine love. It finds the love expressed through the two lovers to represent that of God for Israel and Christ for the church, as we mentioned earlier. But it also, and that's important to remember, it's our response to God. When Song of Solomon pops up on the lectionary, it can have the same effect as discovering a centerfold tucked into the pages of a theology textbook. We're just not really sure what to do with it. This poetry, 
that is lurid and erotic, that finds itself almost exactly in the middle of Holy Scripture. Now, a lot of preachers usually pretend it's not even in the Bible. And yet, one of my favorite passages from this text are verses 11 and 12. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. If the weather's just right, this becomes a lovely addition to Easter morning, heralding the resurrection of Christ and the springtime renewal of the earth. Some find the Song of Solomon perplexing as to even why it is included in the biblical canon at all. Some insist it is simply an allegory of the relationship between God and Israel, between Christ and the church, but it always seems to be a relationship between God and Christ and us, individually and collectively. And while we don't really know what the author had in mind specifically, we do know that in these verses we see the kind of intimacy that God intended for us to have with God and with one another from the beginning. A relationship where desire and commitment win over objectification and selfishness. And it's a relationship that we want to pursue and value and celebrate. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Don't wear a robe very often. Okay, thank you. I'm okay. No, I can do it. Beloved in Christ, the gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and appeared to Mary Magdalene. And later that day sat at the table with two disciples and was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. Men and women, youth and children will come from I'm, I'm breaking up. I'm turning up. Okay. I got a green light. Men and women, youth and children will come from the north and the south and the east and the west to gather about Christ's table. This table is open to all Christians who wish to know the presence of Christ and to receive the blessing of grace. Come, not because you must, but because you may. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God Most High. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took the bread and broke it, saying, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you eat and drink in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Consecrate, therefore, by your Holy Spirit these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be set apart from a common to a sacred use. Bless those who receive them at this table, that they may be united with Christ and with one another, and may continue to be faithful in all things. Amen. Come, for all is prepared.
This is the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. This cup is the new covenant in Christ's blood that is shed for the forgiveness of all our sins. Take and drink. Together in our prayer of thanksgiving. We thank you, God, for inviting us to this table where we have known the presence of Christ and have received all Christ's gifts. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and let us show forth your grace in our lives through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Scripture tells us when they finished in the upper room, they sang a hymn. I invite those of you as you are able to stand and join with me in our closing hymn.
as members of Christ's body, put love above all else. Do not love in word or speech only. Love also in deed and truth. May your relationships with each other be symbols of God's relationship to you.